Hey, this is JT. Welcome to another episode of Life at Bethel, where we're going to discuss the good, the bad, and yes, as always, the ugly. In my last video, we left off talking about the PT, or the public talk. I remember when I was given the opportunity to give my first public talk, I was pretty much looking forward to it because someone had promised me that they were going to help me put it together. The person who promised this to me was someone who actually became my mentor at Bethel. The society at this time was in the process of starting to do a lot of recordings of the Watchtower that wakes on cassettes. Some of you may remember that. And one of the things that the society needed is they needed people who could do voiceovers or read for the Watchtower, basically is what it was. So they sent out an invitation to anyone who was a minister or servant that you could actually audition to be one of the society's voiceover readers. And so I said, I'm going to go for it. Now, what's interesting is when I went down there that morning to read, to do my audition, it was amazing. It was probably about 150 brothers in a line, as far as you could see, just a line of brothers who were down there to audition. We was down in what was called the 3025 building. And the individuals who were going to be doing the audition in front of were people who were part of the writing department and part of the service department. These were the brothers who would be evaluating whether or not you had the reading skills or your voice sounded just the way the society wanted it to sound so that you could be one of their readers. So here me from North Carolina, I figured I can do this thing with my little Southern draw. So got in line, started working my way up to the front. Got to the front and the brother stepped out of his office and says, Brother JT, you're next. So I go into his office. Now, you were allowed to read anything you want to read. You could read from the yearbook, bound volume, wake, whatever magazine material you wanted to read from. So I had my little yearbook there, and I was going to read uh, to, to uh, Brother R.P. Now, R.P. was an interesting man because R.P. was part of the service department. He'd been a circuit overseer, district overseer. He was called into Bethel. His basic job while he was there was known as a troubleshooter. He was the brother the society sent anywhere in the United States where they were having problems with elders, and he literally was authorized by the governing body to delete and appoint elders on the spot. That's who this man was. And everybody knew who he was. So I was real nervous, like, oh, boy, I'm going to try to do a good job, I'm try to do a good job. So he says, Brother JT, you ready to, to read? And so I start reading. I read maybe three sentences. <laughs> R.P. says, stop, stop. He says, uh, Brother JT, are you from down south? I said, yes, sir. He said, what part? I said, I'm from North Carolina. He said, I thought so. He says, look, the society is looking for a certain voice tone and voice inflection, uh, a certain articulation of words. And your southern draw is not exactly what the society is looking for. But we certainly appreciate you coming down this morning to audition for us. Oh, man. Oh, I just stab wounds everywhere. Oh, I was so hurt. I thought I could read. I've been reading since I was in the first grade and stuff. So, but it was the, the sound that they were looking for. They were looking for someone who could have that vanilla flavored type voice, not an accent that would be easily picked up. Can you imagine you getting your cassette and you got JT reading? He's not even North Carolina. So that wasn't what the society wanted. So now, this particular scenario in, the, in that morning was very much like American Idol. You know, where people come out of the room with the little cars, I made it, I made it. Well, that's kind of the way it was that morning. I mean, guys would come out, got it, man, got it. And, uh, and then you have guys who would come out who didn't pass. And they would come out, and then they got to walk past 100 guys, you know, and uh, just, 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 just hide their face. And the guys would just laugh, man, you can't read, you can't read. You know, and so, oh, man, it was so embarrassing. Oh, it was so embarrassing. So I went on to work, and uh, about three days later, about three days later, uh, phone in the factory rings. Now, in the factory, because you can't hear a regular phone ring, they have the phones tied into bells. And so uh, phone rung, and somebody hollered, JT, telephone. So I go over to the phone, hello, JT. And the brother says, RP. I said, how you doing? I said, good, good. He says, look, he said, I was just thinking about you. He says, would you like to be able to improve in your quality of reading um, so that you perhaps could qualify when the society extends an invitation, open invitation again for those who will be reading on this cassettes and so forth, for the videos and for all the assemblies and all that kind of good stuff. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. 
He said, I'll tell you what. He says, meet me Monday night after the family watchtower study in one of the conference rooms in the Towers building. I said, I'll be there. So sure enough, uh, after the Watchtower study, I went over to uh, the Towers building, which is one of the society's buildings in Brooklyn. Um, went to one of the conference rooms he told me to meet him at. And sure enough, he was sitting in there. I got in there. He had a, I remember he had, he had a legal pad. He had one of those cassette players like one you used to get from Radio Shack, Tandy, one of the little, one of the buttons on it. And he had a couple of books. He says, what we're going to do, Brother JT, is I, I want you to start reading. We're going to record and then we're going to play it back. And I want you to listen to how you sound, your inflection, your, your diction, and how you articulate the words. And so I said, okay. And that's what we did. And we did it that Monday night. He says, we'll get together again next Monday night. And we did this on a regular basis for quite some time. And then, of course, you no know, schedule. He'd be out of town and so forth. We'd work around. And so this man literally became my mentor. And so he said to me, he says, now, when the elders in your hall give you your first public talk, you let me know. I'll help you put it together. And that's what he did. Um, I mean, RP helped me put together my first public talk. Um, and that was what I used for many, many years. Uh, when the elders asked me to select the public talk that I wanted to give, um, I knew what kind of talk I did not want to give. I knew what kind of talk did not appeal to me. I didn't like him. I just, I just found very little interest in those kinds of talks. And there was ones where brothers dealt with chronology. Society is trying to add two plus two and get nine, you know, that kind of crazy stuff. The talks that I like were the talks that dealt with how we live our lives, how we touch other people's lives, how we change and become better people. And that's why I selected the talk that I did. I selected a talk, two talks I was selected, I was able to select. One is, does your thinking agree with God? And the other was, is the truth transforming your life. These became two of my mainstay talks, even though I had about six talks I gave. These were the two that got requested the most when other congregations would ask. Um, because they dealt with how people dealt with each other in the congregation. When I would give this talk, I would often mention, uh, I would make the point, I would say, you know, we are required to go out in service and sometimes we become so enamored in trying to bring people into the truth that we fail to see our brother or our sister that's sitting beside us is falling out the back door. Uh, the preaching work is important, but we can't forget how we treat each other in the congregation. And I used to have people who would come up to me now for the talk, uh, many times elders, they would say, JT, man, we needed that dog, man. I think that was a good dog. We, 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 we really need that point. But a lot of the friends especially, I mean, you would hear friends come to you and say, Brother JT, I... I almost decided not to come to the meeting today. I'm glad I came. I, I really needed that. So those were the kind of things and type of talks that I personally enjoyed because I knew when I heard a speaker give a talk about how we as people should treat one another, that meant something to me. Uh, the talks on chronology and trying to calculate stuff, you know, that, that's as, as we know now, most of that stuff is, is bogus anyway. Uh, but how people treat each other as Christians as servants of God, I felt was something that the friends needed to do. And so after a period of time, the elders actually asked me, the, the presiding overseer, he came to me one day and said, JT, look, uh, as, the, as the PO, you know, I'm in charge of all the talks, but I need somebody to help me. You know, you're at Bethel. I want to give you this assignment. I want to put you in charge of getting our speakers. He said, but now I only have one requirement. He says, we don't do wholesale speakers. We don't want to do wholesale speakers. So one of my responsibilities in the congregation was to get speakers for Sunday talks. And the way a lot of brothers who were assigned to give talks, and especially guys, other guys at Bethel, is they would do what's called wholesale speakers. For example, if you had eight or nine speakers in your congregation, and he had 11 speakers in his congregation, you just switch. You give me your 11, I give you my nine. And so as a, as a speaker coordinator, you fill nine slots like that. But you didn't always have good speakers. <laughs> So my PO told me, he said, JT, you ask the coordinator, you say, give me your top speakers. Who are your top speakers? Who are your best speakers? Because we want to get the best speakers to our congregation. And so a lot of guys are like, well, JT, man, you know, I, you know, I, I, I got nine speakers. You're only taking four. I said, well, you told me only four were good speakers, so that's all I'm taking. And uh, that's what we did. And so that was part of my responsibility was to coordinate talks in my congregation. Um, 
being at Bethel was kind of unique, especially being in Brooklyn. And as I mentioned before, this is really the difference between being in Brooklyn and being at the farm. There are many people, uh, Bethelites, who will tell experience about the farm, and their experiences will be sometimes very different because of the way the lifestyle, the way we live. One of the nice things is that as a speaker coordinator, you will be sitting right next to guys who did the question readers. This guy here, he's writing the Wake magazine. He does, you know, he does young people ask questions. And so you could actually ask these guys or extend to them an invitation to give talks in your hall. Some of the speakers were just difficult. We had this one brother, a uh, very, very well-known speaker. His name was J.R. Brown. He went on to become, uh, from being a circuit district overseer, working in the writing department, he went on to become the society's public relations uh, spokesman for a number of years. And so this man was considered a very dynamic speaker by so many people uh, because he had traveled in the district where he served a lot of the major urban cities. So he was well known. Uh, it was like impossible to get J.R. Brown to come to your hall to give a talk. I remember asking him one day, uh, you know, Brother Brown, uh, you know, I'm a speaker coordinator in the congregation. You know, we're trying to you know, get some speakers out and love to have you out. The friends appreciate the talk. And he said to me, he said, Brother J.T., uh, let me look at my calendar and I'll get back with you. I said, all right, I, 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 I. So a couple of days later, I saw Jr. Uh, in the in the in the lunchroom, in the dining room, Lord Diner, and I says, he says, uh, I looked over my calendar. And says, I'm good to go around March the third. And I said, okay, that sounds good. And I said, what? When is that now? March third? He says, yes, March third. But that's four years out. I was like, oh Lord, <laughs> Man, I can't wait them four years to get on talk. So. I said, I said to myself, well, I tell you what, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm only scheduling for the next 12 months. So, so, and he said, well, you better take it. I said, what? Well, and so I said, well, I'll take it. And he ended up giving, he ended up being assigned some talk, some, some, some special assembly that week. So he wasn't able to come out anyway. But one of the most interesting uh, invitations I extended was to a member of the governing body. And the governing body, they are very, very difficult to get as a local speaker in New York City, you know, because they're flying around the world giving talks. They're giving talks in opening branches and, and conventions and assemblies. So for them to come to a local kingdom hall in New York City, it's almost impossible. But I said, hey, give it a try. It's all you can do. So I wrote a letter to three different governing body members, three governing body members I felt comfortable with. And I waited a week, two weeks, three weeks, and then I got a note back from one of the governing body members. His name was George Genghis. George Gangas was a little short Greek brother. And he wrote me back and he says, I will be more than delighted to come to your congregation. Oh man, I got on the phone, called up the PO. <laughs> we got a governing body, man. We got a governing body. And he says, JT, clear off the schedule. Whatever date he gives you, you tell whoever schedule, we'll get back with you later on. And sure enough, there was somebody scheduled, local brother in New York says, look, man, I got the governing body coming, man. <laughs> we'll get you in a couple of months. And uh, so as the weeks moved up, about a week before he was to come out to my congregation, uh, I got a call from the, from, the, from, the, from the office. And they said, we understand that Brother Gangas will be accompanying you to give a talk at your congregation. We just wanted to know about the arrangement, transportation, and, and so forth, and how it makes sure we'd be able to get there back and forth. Um, and I said, yeah, we, we got somebody going to pick him up. We got everything, everything squared. So sure enough, in my congregation, which was a very, very common thing, uh, the Bethel Lights, we rarely ever came back to Bethel after our meetings to have dinner at Bethel. The reason why is because we got an invitation every, I mean, literally every Sunday you got an invitation from the old friends. This goes back to what I mentioned earlier in one of our videos. The old friends in the congregation, they're your key to survival. So we always got an invitation out for the meeting. When you get there, you know, they done cooked up so much food. You're like, oh my God, sister, I can't eat all this stuff. And so this was the invitation was sent to all the Bethelites every week. We, 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 you come, you, as they say, bring your Tupperware. That's all you need because you were taking something back when you left. So one of the sisters, one of the elders' wives, she said, would he be willing to come over for dinner. You think you schedule why? Because you know you figure the governing body is busy, they'll just give it talk. We figured he'd give it talk and just leave for the watch tower perhaps. But now nah, he says, no, nah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the whole meeting. He said, in fact, I want to do the whole day with your congregation. I want to go out and feel service with you guys. And I was like, oh man. 
Now, our congregation, we had field service in the morning because our meetings were in the afternoon. So I said, Brother Gangus, you know, we meet in field service for the morning. Then we go to the Kingdom Hall. We grab a little snack on the way, uh, a little sandwich or something. And then we go to the Kingdom Hall. Afterwards, one of the friends wanted to have you over for dinner. He says, I'm fine, fine, fine. So first thing in the morning, we pick up Gangus and we go to our book study. At the time, we was meeting in people's homes for book studies. Of course, folks who never showed up for field service on Sunday morning, because that's when our field service time was. <laughs> book study was packed. Book study was packed. We had folks coming from other book studies coming over. So, uh, so we're working. So Gang says he's going to work with the friends. So we're working. In, now, keep in mind, it's very important to keep in mind. We are working in a territory in the ghetto. We're working in the hood. This is when crack was king in Harlem during the 80s. I mean, it was, you would see drug dealers on the street. You would see them in the hallways. Uh, you see the crack vials in the elevators. I mean, it was, it was, it was on. I mean, it was on. So we're in this building with Genghis. So Genghis is, we're working floor over floor. So Genghis is working for a different friend as we're working down to the, to the lobby. Start at the top, work your way down to the lobby. So he's switching off with people as he's working. He's switching off with people as he's working. And all of a sudden, you know, we get down to the lobby and it's like, well, who's working with Brother Gaines? Well, I thought he was with you. I thought he was with you. No, no, I thought he was with me. He's on the third floor. My heart, oh my God, my, my heart just sunk. All I could see, they're going to kick me out of Bethel today. I'm flying home today. And, uh, I mean, we lost the governing body member. We lost a governing body member. So every couple of brothers, we, we run up the steps, people take the elevators, we go through, we're like, I don't see this dude. So then we step outside the building, probably about a half a block down, we see a crowd, a crowd of people. And we're like, me and two or three other brothers, we just start running. We're like, we're going to have to fight the day. We're going to have to fight the day. Because all we can see is this little white head, little white man in the middle of all of these African-American people. I'm like, oh my God. We got to fight today. And we get up there, <laughs> and Gangus is entertaining everybody. One of the most interesting presentations I have ever seen, and he did this as we walked to the Kingdom Hall as well, because we, when we finished the, the group, we walked to the hall. Gangus would actually walk up to people, and this is, like I said, this was African American community, and he would just walk up to them, people, he would say, Excuse me, sir, you are black, I am white. Why can't we be friends? I'm like, man, you can get us killed out here, man. You can get us killed doing this kind of crazy stuff. So, but that was the approach that Gangus had used. And sure enough, he was cleaning out his bag using that approach. I mean, the man was cleaning out his bag. He was cleaning out his bag. So after we went to the Kingdom Hall, he gave his talk. Then we went over to one of the friend's home for dinner. Sister had prepared just a, just a, I remember she had, she prepared Cornish hens, you know, little tiny, little tiny chicken. Cornish hens and, 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 all, and, and all the dressings for everybody. And the uh, house was packed because everybody wanted to come over. You know, who's going to, every, I mean, everybody wanted to come. There was, there was some brothers like, you know, go ahead, I'll, I'll, I'll catch them next time. Uh, so we get over there and we have dinner. Dinner's fine. Everything's good. Now we think Gangus is going to leave. Like, you ready to go, brother Gangus? No, I'm going to relax, relax. So at this point, it's question and answer time. It's question and answer time. So people going around the room asking him kind of question. And a lot of people ask questions, but there was one question I remember so well. The question that the sister was when the elders wives, um, her and her husband, they were probably the best couple in terms of being in love that you have ever seen. And they had been married like 20 some years and they, you would think they just got married last week. Um, so this sister, she says, brother Gingas, I have a question. You know, the society says that if a woman's husband dies before they get into the new system, when she or he comes back in the new system, they will no longer be husband or wife. Do you think that will always be the case? And so everybody in the room was like, okay, we're going to see where it's going now. We're going to see where this was going. And Gangus's answer was very, very interesting. The first thing he did was he qualified it. He says, the society teaches that they will no longer be husband and wife. But he says, 
I have personal thoughts on it. And he says, I believe that Jehovah's going to work something out. And so everybody in the room was like, he says, don't quote me, but everybody's going to work something out. And uh, just looking back at what public talks can do, uh, public talks can be very good over the years. I've heard very good talks as I grew up as a kid. And then some talks, as you know, today, they don't even hold any water. But it was all told as this is the truth. Accept it or you don't love God. And so as I look back at myself, you know, the talks I, I gave and the people uh, who came up to me and said, I'm, glad I'm still going to the meeting. You know, I, I wonder where many of those people are today. I really do. And the impact and the role that I played in bringing people into a religion that literally takes them, takes good people, sincere people, and literally just weighs them down with burdensome rules that are nothing more than man-made rules. And over the years, uh, the question has often been asked, you know, where would the public talks go? I, mean, I had an interesting conversation with a couple of former elders and one current elder. And we were talking about this new format that the society now has. Because years ago, elders actually used to make up their own talks. And so you had brothers all out in left field on all kinds of subjects. Then the society clamped down pretty much the outline. And the question we were discussing when we were talking about was with the new monitors, the two giant TV screens that you basically see in most kingdom halls, what do you see could actually happen to public talks? You know, I can see the day coming. When the society will take those two TV monitors on the wall of most kingdom halls around the world and broadcast live or broadcast from a recording what the public talk will be for that Sunday. In other words, elders will not be giving talks. I can see that coming. It is, it's, like, it's like handwriting on the wall. Because over the years, elders used to make up their own outlines. And they went out in left field. Then the society went to the the manuscript in there, as well as the outline format. And I can see the day very clearly when elders won't really be giving talks. The society will broadcast that stuff straight out of New York. And the congregation will just sit there and watch the television. If you want to see a scene that really, in my personal mind, my personal thoughts, that depicts what Jehovah's Witnesses will look like down the road at the Kingdom Hall, go to Google, type in, 1984, Apple Macintosh, and see what they're showing about 1984 from the Apple Corporation. That reminds me of what I personally can see happening to Jehovah's Witnesses down the road. And the public talk will be leading it. Once again, this is JT. Thank you for listening to another episode as we discuss life at Bethel, the good, the bad, and yes, the ugly. Take care of yourself. Well, we invite you to subscribe to our channel and be sure to hit that bell so that you can receive notifications when we upload new content. Give us a thumbs up if you like this video. This program was sponsored by Critical Thinkers.